Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is uh, 6 p.m. in Paris, 5 p.m. in London, noon in New York, 1 a.m. in Beijing in China. And it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you to this uh, uh, webinar by the International Academy for Clinical Hematology. Uh, I'm Mohamed Moti from the Sorbonne University and St. Antoine Hospital in Paris, uh, in France. And it is my great pleasure to introduce you today to our uh, guest speaker, uh, Dr. Clementine Sarkozy. Uh, well, by the way, if you are curious and you're asking the question, she's not the daughter of former President Sarkozy, but she is a top expert in the field of uh, lymphoma. Uh, Dr. Sarkozy is an MD, PhD, highly specialized in lymphoma. She trained at the University Hospital uh, of uh, Lyon uh, with the uh, late uh, Professor Coiffier. Then she did a fellowship in Vancouver. She also uh, worked uh, for a couple of years uh, in phase one uh, clinical uh, trials. Uh, and she is now a consultant hematologist focused on the treatment of uh, lymphoma, especially mantle cell and follicular lymphoma uh, at the uh, Curie Institute in Paris. So you would uh, see you will have really an amazing webinar. And it is quite unique, actually, because I was just looking into uh, the recent uh, uh, literature of uh, lymphoma. And actually, I noticed it's roughly 25 years since we had the seminal uh, original publication in JCO about rituximab uh, as a single agent in uh, uh, relapsed so-called indolent lymphomas. And that was the famous IDEX C2 uh, B8. 25 years ago, and today we are already uh, talking about bispecific and tri-specific antibodies in lymphoma. It's a true revolution, immune therapy, whether cellular therapy or these uh, uh, T-cell uh, engagers, but hopefully soon also innate immunity engagers. So uh, Dr. Sarkozy has prepared for you a fantastic webinar. She will deliver this live, but of course, please do not hesitate to uh, share your questions, your comments, uh, whatever suggestions, and I'll do my best after the talk of uh, Dr. Sarkozy uh, to uh, have a Q&A and answer these questions. But now, for the time being, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Clementine Sarkozy. Clementine, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Professor Moti, for this uh, very kind introduction. It's my really great pleasure to be with you uh, this evening or this morning to talk about the bispecific and trispecific in non hodgkin lymphoma. So, share my screen. So, I'm Clementine Sarkozy, working in Curie Hospital uh, in St. Clou, and we will discuss today non a bit bispecific and tri-specific in non-ontogen lymphoma. So uh, as an introduction, I will first expose a few concepts and backgrounds on non ontogen lymphoma and the clinical unmet needs, as well as what we know on monoclonal antibodies. And then I will expose the structures of bispecific and thin cell engagers and the clinical data on CD3, CD20 bispecific in non ontogen lymphoma. And finally, we will discuss about the perspectives. So lymphoma, as you know, is a very heterogeneous disease. And within the B-cell lymphoma, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is a most common aggressive form representing 40% of the cases. And follicular lymphoma is the most frequent indolent form of non hodgkin lymphoma representing 20% of all B-cell non hodgkin lymphoma. And finally, we will also discuss today mountain cell lymphoma that is the third type of B-cell non hodgkin lymphoma. These different B cell malignancies show features that are characteristic of reminiscence of B cell at specific time points during the differ differentiation and maturation. And 
this is well described in the WHO uh, classification. And therefore, they do express CD20 and CD19 as a stable antigen. And these stable antigen are very good potential therapeutic target. The development of monoclonal antibody as a therapeutic treatment began uh, in the 1975 by researchers funded by the NCI. And they described the formation of epiderma to rescue and produce a limitless supply of monoclonal antibodies from a single B cell. And this was followed by pioneer study by the Ron Levis group at Stanford, which produced patient-specific monoclonal anti adjective antibodies for treating lymphoma patients. And these studies were very efficient but they were less efficient for commercialization because the, the limitation was due to the fact that they were patient specific. At the same time, antibodies were being used to investigate the cell surface protein that we just saw, re resulting to the identification of B-cell restricted antigens such as CD20 and CD19. And given the widespread expression of CD20 on the B-cell, the treatment with a marine monoclonal antibody against CD20 was undertaken and demonstrated safety, albeit with limited clinical activity at the beginning. But this ultimately led to the development of a human and marine chimeric anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody with increased antitumor activity, namely rituximab. So IV rituximab was the first therapeutic monoclonal antibody to be used in the field of oncology, establishing a new class of anti-cancer drugs. And then subcutaneous rituximab was developed to simplify the administration and shorten the administration time. So what are the mechanisms of action of rituximab? So first, Rituximab can bind to CD20 on the B cell surface and it will cause activation of the complement cascade, which generates the membrane attack complex, which can directly induce B cell lysis by complement dependent cytotoxicity or CDC. Second, the binding of rituximab will allow interaction of NK cell via FC receptor, which leads to antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity or ADCC. Third, the FC portion of rituximab and the deposited complement fragments allow the recognition by both FC receptors and complement receptor on macrophages, which leads to phagocytosis and ADCC. And finally, the cross-linking of several molecules of rituximab and CD20 in the lipid raft determined the interaction of this complex with elements of a signaling pathway involving sarcinase that mediate direct apoptosis. So even though we uh, have rituximab that induces a lot of progress uh, in non oncogenic lymphoma, we still have some very important unmet medical needs. So first in DLBCL, we know that 25 to 30% of the patient will present a relapsed disease. And among these patients, 20% will present a refractory disease. And these patients, as you can see here on the survival curves, have a dramatic outcome, whether they are primary refractory, relapsing at, after two lines of therapy or relapsing after uh, autologous T cell transplantation. Of course, these survival curves from the scholar study are not the same uh, now with CAR T cell. In follicular lymphoma, 20% of the patients uh, will present a progression of the disease within two years. And these patients on the blue curves here will have a dismal uh, overall survival compared to patients without any progression. Indeed, these patients will present an eight times greater risk of dying from lymphoma as compared to patients without any relapse uh, from a lymphoma within two years. Finally, in mantle cell lymphoma, 20% of the patient will present high risk features, namely being refractory to BTK inhibitors on the first survival curves here, or presenting a high risk MIPI score, or presenting some molecular features such as, such as TP53 mutations. And of course, a long-term toxicity of the current standard of care based on immuno immunochemotherapy represent also an unmet medical link in non oncogenic lymphoma. So what are bispecific? Bispecific are man-made antibody-based molecules with two different antigen binding sites. And T-cell engager are bispecific bi antibodies that bind targets on tumor cell or CD20, CD19, if we talk about non-oncogenic lymphoma, and immune effector cells or CD3. 
and it, they will bypass the MHC complex, leading to T cell activation and tumor cell killing. So yeah, you have here on the left part of the screen, the normal T cell synapse with the MHC complex restrictions. And on the right part of the screen, the synapse with the bispecific antibody that bypass the MHC complex. Bispecific antibody will nonetheless use the T cells within the TME, but they will also recruit the CD3 cells into the TME to act as a T cell engager. Bispecific evolved in a field of traumatic therapeutic innovation and combination aiming to improve T cell activation and anti-tumor efficacy are developed. Indeed, on the left part of the side, you can see the improved made with, with a targeted agent in nanogen lymphoma, such as venetoclax, BTK inhibitors, EZDH2 inhibitors, or PI3 kinase inhibitors. Immune-based agents also led to dramatic improvement in the treatment of uh, nanogen lymphoma, such as, of course, CAR T cell therapy that are not approved in second line uh, for the treatment, or lenalidomide and tafacitamide, but also antibody drug conjugate. And finally, bispecific evolved in these fields and combination, we will see that a combination uh, to improve the antitumor efficacy are definitively warranted, and more particularly with lenalidomide. So what are the structure of bispecific antibody and T-cell engagers? So the first demonstration of the bispecific antibody concept uh, was made more than 50 years ago in 1964. And that uh, the, the combination of the different uh, heavy and light charge possibility led to the hybridoma complex with only efficacy to uh, manufacture the bispecific antibody in 12% of the cases. Later on, the first demonstration of the T cell right, right direction with uh, CD3 and a target on the tumor cell was demonstrated. The uh, solution uh, for the heavy and light chain uh, complex uh, generation was then fold, found, uh, with a NOPS into a solution and then with a light chain pairing issue. And then later on, the FDA approval of a Catumaxumab was the first one approved, but then uh, was uh, retired from the market due to uh, too much toxicity. And blinatumumab was the first by a specific antibody uh, with a, a single uh, FA fragment generation. And we can see now that very, uh, very uh, we, we, we just had the FDA approval for a CD3020 monoclonal antibody as mosinatumumab or a glofitamab. So the first in class base specific antibody are recombinant combining the binding molecule without a fragment crystallizable or FC portion. So you can see here that it's a fusion protein of the variable region of the heavy and the light chain of the immunoglobulin. It's very efficacious in generating a T cell effector response against the antigen, but it had a very short half life of only 1.5 to 2 hours due to the absence of the FC RN portion leading to the necessity of the continuous IV infusions. Furthermore, there is no AFC mediated effector function as ADCC, ADPC, or complement activation, which is also another drawback. Different formats exist with this kind of FC of a single chain FV fragment as byte, bike, or dots. And this is uh, the this is the, the class of Blinatunumab. So the next generation of specific of bispecific antibody are immunoglo immunoglobulin-like structures, and they contain a FC domain. So they have PK properties of monoclonal antibody and a longer half-life. They can generate a long-lasting immune anti-effector response, and they have a silent FC region to avoid FC gamma receptor and CD3 cross-linking to reduce the cytotoxicity and ADCC. Different technology as nopes into holes or cross map or dual body technologies solved the issue of the heavy and the light chair mis pairing, leading to a much more efficient um, manufacturing process. 
And there are even more new newer generation uh, by specific antibody with different FC portion as IgG4 or IgM and different number of AVB regions with more antigen binding units leading to a tri-specific with two to one or tetravalent uh, antibody with variable ability, stabilization of the tumor anti-cell synapse and cytotoxic potential. So these are the most ardent CD20 immunoglobulin-like T-cell engager in non hodgkin lymphoma. Mosunetuzumab, glofitamab, epcoritamab, ontronexamab, or plamotamab. Most of them have a IgG1 format, except ontronexamab, that is the IgG4 format. They have either rituximab or obinutizumab or ofitumab epitop. Most of them have an IV administration, except for epcoritamab and uh, very likely soon for mosinituzumab that have a subcutaneous administration. Each of them have different technology uh, process with some particularity of glofitamab that have two different uh, CD20 portions and one CD3 portion with a head to tail uh, linking. All of them are administrated with a step-up dosing process, and we will see why and how it goes. And <clears throat> the two first, mosinituzumab and glofitamab, have a fixed duration with um, 17 cycles or 12 cycles, whereas epcoritamab, ogdronextamab, or plamotamab are currently developed until progression. And we have EMA or FDA approval for mosinituzumab, glofitamab, likely soon for epcoritamab and uh, ondronextamab. So what are the clinical data on CD3, CD20 bispecific antibody? The first, we will see the efficacy as single agent for mosunetuzumab in follicular lymphoma, for mosunetuzumab in elderly DLBCL, also for glofitamab and epcoritamab in DLBCL, and for glofitamab in mantle cell lymphoma. So mosunetuzumab was one of the first bispecific antibody developed in relapsed and refractory follicular lymphoma. So inclusion, the inclusion criteria of this, one, of this phase one, two pivotal trial was being in third line or more. Mosun has an IV administration, 21 day cycle, and there is a step up dosing to avoid the cytokine release syndrome with one, two, 60, and then 30 milligram. Patients receive eight cycle if they reach a CR and up to 17 cycle if they reach a PR. And the primary endpoint of this study was the complete response rate with a goal of 40% with coponizib, that is the previous PIT kinase inhibitors. So you can see here that the patients uh, were heavily pretreated with a median of three lines of previous uh, therapy, and 31% of the patients had received more than three lines. 21% had previously received an autologous stem cell transplantation, 69 were refractory to the last previous therapy and half of them are the POD24 or uh, a relapse within two years from treatment initiation that is associated with a poorer overall survival as we saw before. So you can see how the, the, the dramatic efficacy of uh, mosinutizumab in relapse and refractory FL that led uh, to the FDA approval. So almost all the patients have a benefit from mosinutizumab. The overall response rate is 78% and 60% of complete response, but, and the time to complete response is only three months. The two-year PFS is 51%, the two-year duration of response 61%, and the time to next pre pre uh, treatment sorry, 60% at two years. And the two years overall survival is 79%. And at ASH these years, uh, Barnett et al. presented an update of these data showing that Mosinutizumab can lead to double the PFS compared uh, to the previous line of therapy here in a range. And when uh, we compare to CAR T cell, even though it's not, of course, a strict comparison, but it's still good to put everything in the context. Well, with CAR T cell or the LRA study, we have a two years PFS of 57%, two years duration of response of 65%, and two years duration of CRF of 68%. So definitively, I think that by specific antibody can uh, compared to CAR T cell in this context, at least with this uh, data that requires updates and longer follow up. So, what is the toxicity profile of mosinutizumab in relapse and refractory follicular lymphoma? So, the most common adverse event is CRS, 44% of the patients, but only 2% of grade 3 to 5 CRS. 
23% on D1 cycle one and 38% of the cases on D15 cycle one. So the majority of CRS is during the cycle one. The median time to CRS is five hours after the D1, 20 after the D8, and 27 hours after the D15, which is important for the patient management in or out patient. 15% of the CRS required steroids, 8% TOSI, and 10% both. And importantly, 25% of the patient had to be hospitalized for CRS monitoring. And the CRS will have a three days duration. The second most common uh, adverse event and the most common with grade three to five adverse event is neutropenia with 27% of grade three to four neutropenia. The median duration is eight day and there were no febrile neutropenia reported in the studies. And importantly, no grade five related adverse events. So mesinetizumab is well tolerated in the global population, but is it also well tolerated in the elderly uh, patients? So compared with younger patients, those aged uh, greater than 65 or older had higher response rates, very interestingly, with an overall response of 87% versus 77% and a CR rate of 70 versus 55%. The same duration of response, and the rate of grade three to four adverse events were comparable in older and younger patients, 73 versus 68 respectively. And very interestingly, all the patients had a lower, lower rate of serious adverse events of any grade versus younger patients, 37 versus 52%. Finally, the CRS occurred less frequently in patients older than 65 years old than in those younger than 65 years old. So all in all, mosinetizumab is as efficient or even slightly more efficient in older patients, and it's definitely not more toxic. So now we switch to mosinetizumab in the elderly population, but with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So again, the most frequent subtype of, non of aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So in this phase two trial, mosinetizumab was investigated as a single agent in first line for elderly unfit DLBCL. Eligib uh, eligibility criteria was for patient not able to receive a, cur a curative intent chemotherapy with antracycline. 54 patients were included. The median age was 83 years old. 81% of the patient had a stage three to four, and the follow-up was 23 months in median. Half of the patient responded and 43% reached a CR. The median duration of CR was 16 months and 11 out of 23 maintained the CR for more than one year. Neutropenia was reported in 50% and there were no icons. So for this uh, very hard to treat uh, population, uh, mosinetizumab seems to be very promising and maybe combination with non-cytotoxic agent could also be an option for this uh, elderly population unfit for chemotherapy. So now we switch to glofitamab. So as we previously, we previously uh, discussed, glofitamab has a different format with a two to one molecular format to increase the efficacy. As you can see here, we have two parts for linking CD20 and one for CD3. And the head to tail format increased to have a flexibility and a very close CD3 and CD20 target options. So it shows in vitro uh, a 40 times greater tumor lysines than the one to one by specifics. We also have an increase in the synapse formation, as you can see here with the T cell in green and the tumor cell in blue, an increased binding avidity and stabilization of the T cell and tumor cell synapse. This induced a T cell activation and a greater cyto cytokine release, as you can see here on the heat map, as well as a greater efficacy in the mouse model with the complete separation of the CD19 staining in the spleen and in the lymph node. So what about the toxicity? Well, the toxicity was, as expected, increased. So what was done to reduce the cytotoxy was to use obinutuzumab that has the same epitope compared to glofitamab. So obinutuzumab pretreatment to mitigate the CRS associated with the CD20 uh, T cell redirecting administration. The GA101 pretreatment reduced the T cell activation and the cytokine release in the peripheral blood. 
So it increased the safety of clofitumab administration. Indeed, you can see on the heat map here that the cytokine release without obinutuzumab pretreatment is pretty uh, drastic. But if you use Gaziva or GA101 pretreatment, you don't have, of course, after Gaziva administration, any cytokine release. And when you put clofitamab at the second administration, at the second dose, then the cytokine release is definitely much lower. And in parallel, we also have a synergistic activity, as you can see here, with the combination of Gaziva and uh, clofitamab. So what about the clinical efficacy? What well, it induced 39% of complete response in relapse and refractory DLBCL. And this was recently presented at ASH and published in the New England Journal of Medicine, leading to the FDA approval at the fast track. So 155 patients were treated with a step up dose, again, to reduce the CRS and obinutuzumab pretreatment at D1, then glofitamab at D8, 2.5 milligram, 10 milligram at D15, and 30 milligram on D1C2 up to 12 cycles. This is an inpatient for the cycle one and then outpatient. The median of line of therapy were three, including corticel for 35% of the patients. The median follow up was 12 months, and half of the patients responded, and again, 39 were in complete response. The time to CR is 43 days. What about uh, the outcome after um, the median? So again, after a uh, median follow-up of one year, the median PFS is 4.9 months. Overall survival is non-rich. The median duration of response is 18 months. And when they looked in a small cohort of patients that received glofitamine for a longer follow-up and at a lower dose during the phase one, the median duration of CR was 36 months. Very importantly, late events are rare. 68% of the patient in complete response at the end of treatment remained in CR after one year, and the end of treatment is after 12 cycles or nine months. Two patients had a progressive disease after one year, and they were retreated with glofitamab and reached a second complete response. So again, if we put that in the context of of, of SCORA5 or primary refractory patient, definitely we see a dramatic improvement of the outcome and in the context of CAR T-cell, these are the curves from Zuma, Zuma uh, one study where we see the plateau uh, with axis cell and we are uh, waiting for a longer follow-up to see if we also can have a plateau in the PFS or duration of response curves with glofitamab. So what about the subgroup analysis? First, we have a similar overall response rate and CR rates uh, in patients older and or younger than 65 years old. And very importantly, patients previously treated with CAR T cell, but we will see that in more details in a few minutes. But importantly, patients with a high grade B cell lymphoma or double or triple hit a B cell lymphoma do not show any complete response rate. So out of the 11 patients with high grade B cell lymphoma, only two responded and it was a partial response. Another population that is pretty hard to treat is the refractory patient. And the refractory patient presented the lower CR rate, 34%, compared to 70% for the non-refractory patient. As well, patients with elevated LDH presented a lower CR rate, 33%, versus 59% for patients without elevated LDH. And as I mentioned very, uh, as I mentioned earlier, glofitamide received the FDA uh, granted priority review uh, for the treatment of edul patient with relapse of refractory large visual lymphoma following two lines uh, of therapy. So another bispecific now, epcoritamab monotherapy in the same population of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma patients. So the time to CR is 2.7 months, or so slightly uh, longer, but um, not so much. The median PFS is very comparable, 4.4 months, and median duration of response, 12 months. But again, we need longer follow-up to see if we can have a plateau on the PFS curves. When we look at uh, the subgroup analysis, again, the primary refractory patients benefit less from epcoritumab as compared to the relapsed patients. And no impact of previous CAR T-cell therapy. 
So what about mantle cell lymphoma now? So again, mantle cell lymphoma is a more rare uh, subtypes of uh, non hodgkin lymphoma and the unmet medical need uh, resides in the population of patients that are refractory to BTK inhibitors, that, but that will uh, ultimately concern all the patients. And also patients that present some uh, specific uh, molecular criteria, so such a TP53 mutation or a high uh, MIP uh, combined score with a high ki 67 So in this uh, phase two study, 37 uh, patients with relapse and refractory MCL were treated with glofitamide, and most of them uh, were BTGI pretreated, and 73% were refractory to the last treatment. The overall response rate was 84% and the CR rate 73%. And you can see that almost all the patients presented a reduction in the tumor volume. The medium time to CR was comparable to DLBCL 51 days. What about the duration of response? Well, it was 12 months with 20 out of 23 patients that maintained the CR at the end of treatment. And there were no progressive disease after end of treatment for patients that were still uh, in response at that time. But for COVID-related deaths, and we will see a little bit later on that it is an issue with bispecific. So in this table, uh, we have a summary of the different bispecific activity in the different uh, non hodgkin lymphoma subtypes. So a little bit of color to help in understand. So when we look at follicular lymphoma here presented in blue, well, we can see that overall response rates and complete response rates are pretty high, around uh, 80 to 100% uh, for the overall response rate and around 60% to 75% for the complete response rate. The duration of response as two years is around 50% and 60% uh, for the CR. When we look at DLBCL, uh, well, with glofitamab or adronextamab or epcoritamab, the overall response rate and complete response rates are around 50%, 55%, and 40% respectively, slightly lower for mozinetuzumab that is no longer developed uh, in DLBCL for younger patients, but that is developed for elderly patients, as we saw. The median PFS is around four months, but the median duration of response is, of course, much longer. And finally, for mountain cell lymphoma, we have a dramatic uh, rate of complete response with 73% with very promising duration of response. So what about the in vivo mechanism of action or pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics data in relapse and worth extra non hodgkin lymphoma for bispecific? So we will look here to the example of glofitamab in a DLBCL. So what we can see in DLBCL is a T-cell margination, activation, and proliferation uh, in the peripheral blood that is dependent to the dose of glofitamide, and that is related to the complete response rate. We can see here that there is a decrease in the peripheral blood of CD8 cells that is more important in patients with a CR as compared to the patient that do not reach a CR. And this decrease, again, is related to the glofitamab dosage in the phase one study. We have a dose-dependent induction in inflammatory cytokine, as you can see here in the curve, with a greater uh, induction of the cytokine at the uh, greater dose level with interferon IL-6 or IL-2. But this cytokine release was seen mainly in cycle one and not associated with the response. So what are uh, the modifications in the tumor uh, sample or on the untreatment biopsy after graflitamab. So you have here on the left, the pretreatment, and on the right, the untreatment biopsy. So we definitively see a modification and a reorganization of the CDA cells in the tumor. CDA cells are represented here in green, and we can see an increase of the CDA cell intercepted with the tumor cell represented in pink. And we have here a dose, uh, a dense band of the ADL cell, very close to a necrosis uh, region, suggesting that there were previously a tumor lysis event here. So do we have any biomarker of response with bispecific? So of course, uh, first uh, they looked to the association of CD3, CD4, or CD8 count uh, with the response, as well as CD20 expression. But there is no correlation with CD20 expression in the tumor, uh, in the pretreatment tumor biopsy, or uh, CD3, CD4, and CD8 cell count in the pretreatment blood samples uh, with the response. But 
what we could find, what they could find, sorry, is an associated with some specific baseline uh, gene expression signature in the biopsy and the response. Patient that had a complete response presented a greater uh, TP53 gene expression signature, sig uh, signature and presented a lower PD-1 uh, signature uh, as compared to patients without any complete response. So some gene expression signatures that seems to be related to the tumor cell or TP53 or MIC target gene signature, and some gene expression that seems to be related to the TME cells or PD-1 signature are associated with clofitamab. But this will need to be converted to some translational research to have a, a routinely available biomarker that is currently not the case. So overall, what can be the, the mechanism of resistance to a bispecific antibody? And this were nicely summarized by Faiki et al. very recently in blood. So first, the tumor immune escape with the loss of the target or the specific oncogenic pathway as TP53 mutation, make gene expression signature that can be associated with the resistance. We can so have some dysfunction that are related to the T cell and the activation of Treg or suppressive cells. You can imagine that the bispecific that target the CD3 can target a Treg cells and activate a cell that do not have any uh, cytotoxic um, potential. And uh, we can see also resistance of the tumor cell to a chronic of the tumor T cell, sorry, uh, due to a chronic activation and the persistent TCR triggering leading to the exhaustion of the T cell within the biopsy. And finally, the third mechanism can be uh, related to the TME, but to the non-T cell within the TME, namely the myeloid cell and or the stromal cell uh, that are recruited within the TME. So one of the way to, to go uh, further and to, to improve the efficacy of the bispecific would be to work on the mode of administration. And, uh, what they did in this uh, in vitro uh, model, mimicking the 20A, they continuous infusion with the half-life extended CD19 bispecific, namely um, linatimumab, is that they introduced some treatment-free interval. And they could see that the treatment-free interval induced functional reinvigoration of the T cell with an increased lysis on D14 uh, as compared to the continuous uh, exposure that induced loss of the T cell functions. And the treatment-free interval improved the T cell expansion and the tumor control in vivo. So definitively, it seems that um, having a treatment up to progression might not be at the best solution, but having some treatment-free interval with retreatment for some specific patients might definitely be, uh, be better to reinvigorate the tumor cell. So what about the safety data overall? So here we have the safety data of two different types of glofitamab and uh, of bispecific antibodies, sorry, uh, glofitamab on the left and mosinitizumab on the right. So what we can see, and it's the case for all uh, bispecific, is that the most frequent adverse event is CRS, but uh, more frequently the CRS are grade one or two with very rare grade uh, three, four or five uh, CRS events. CRS can be uh, found in, in up to 80% of the cases, depending on the trial and on the molecule, with the tocilizumab usage between 0 to 28% of the cases. The second most uh, frequent adverse event is neutropenia in 15 to 30% of the cases, followed by hypophosphatemia in 13 to 29%, anemia 19 to 30%, 38%, fatigue up to 42% of the cases, and diarrhea. Looking a little bit more into the detail of CRS, it usually occurs at cycle one and are at low grade thanks to the step-up of the administration and steroid premedication. So here on the left, we have the example of glofitamab, and you can see that the CRS start mainly at cycle 1D8. So again, we have previously the um, obinutizumab administration. So cycle 1D8 followed by uh, cycle 1D15, and at cycle 2, we have a much less a CRS, and the CRS are only a grade 1 at cycle 2, and no CRS at cycle 3 and cycle 4. For epcoritamab, where we have a slightly different step of dosing uh, administration, we can see that we have more uh, CRS at the third administration, just because the um, 
the way to do the step up dosing is different with a much increased uh, administration at the cycle 1D15. And again, a much lower rate of CRS after that uh, at cycle 1D22 or cycle 2 and uh, so forth and so, so on. As well for plamotamab, again, the CRS occurred uh, during the step up dosing at cycle 1. And after that, you have almost uh, no uh, CRS at cycle 2. And the mandatory dexamethasone premedication uh, with clofitamab lead to a drastic reduction in the CRS and no grade three or more CRS with clofitamab and the step up dosing of 1, 10, and 30 milligrams. So importantly, there were no fatal events related to CRS thanks to, again, the learning curves and their experience, the step up dosing with two or four steps, depending on the molecules, the slow IV infusions, the steroid premedication that is mandatory, the inpatient administration for the highest dose and risk at risk of CRS, and uh, with foglofitamab with the obinutuzumab pretreatment. So to summarize uh, the most frequent adverse events, we have here uh, this table showing that the CRS again will vary uh, between 44% uh, and it's the, the with a mozinutizumab that presents the lowest of CRS and up to 72% uh, with a plamotamab. With three or more CRS are much more rare as compared to CAR T cell. And the icons does not really seems to be an issue, maybe ex except for Epcoritamab, where they represent six persons with one grade five icons, but that was a difficult case. The neutropenia are the the most frequent grade three to four adverse events between 38% to 21%. The uh, administration should be inpatient for the cycle one, but can be outpatient once the CRS per period um, is the way. And the adverse event leading to treatment discontinuation could be reported uh, in up to 14% of the patients with plamotamab uh, and only 3.6% with mosinutizumab. Grade five adverse events were reported in three to nine uh, patients, depending on the study, corresponding to roughly 5% of the cases. And importantly, these adverse events were infectious related and COVID related. So we definitely need some updates now that, that the COVID period is a little bit more be behind us. And given that this trial were conducted in the 2020 uh, years. But the long-term adverse events, of course, are not known yet, and we definitely need a longer close follow-up for the toxicity profile. So what about the context of CAR T-cell where bispecific are developed? So uh, should we discuss about bispecific versus or in combination uh, and in the sequencing with a CAR T-cell? So as you know, uh, CAR T cell uh, have a much different structure because it's a cellular therapy with a synthetic genetic construct, whereas bispecific are recombinant protein. CAR T cell are engineered CD8 and CD4 cells with effector memory and central memory cells. Bispecific use the endogenous CD8 and CD4 cells. For the T cell activation with CAR T cell, we have both signal one and signal two and now they are working on the signal three with the cytokine stimulation ex vivo. Whereas for the bispecific, we only have the signal one and we can see that we will have next generation combination therapy with maybe a signal two. The synapse is typical with bispecifics, with bispecifics and atypical with the CAR T cell. Both can have a serial killing and both use perforine granzide and typical um, typical uh, cell, cytotoxic uh, sorry, uh, granules killing. The trafficking is active uh, with a cell-cell interaction for the CAR T cell and passive uh, for the bispecific with a, a biodistribution that will depend to several factors. So when we look at toxicity profile, here we have uh, a very important distinction with a CAR T cell presenting more grade three or four CRS, two to 20% and almost none uh, with a bispecific. The icons one to 28%, depending on the CAR T cell construct and their percent with uh, almost their percent with a bispecific. The fabrication is autologous and off the shelf uh, for the bispecific. The delay uh, with CAR T cell is definitely a big issue uh, with leukapheresis and fabrication. Uh, three weeks is definitely the minimum, and we know that we have some management uh, difficulties with that. 
and there is no delay uh, for the bispecific. The administration requires to be inpatient with a cortisol with an hospitalization that maybe will reduce, but still uh, for now is around three weeks or two to three weeks. Whereas for bispecific, it needs to be inpatient for the, for the first uh, doses, but then can be definitively outpatient with, for some of them, a subcutaneous administration. The treatment duration is also a drawback for bispecific with one, two years, and some of them being developed up to progression, whereas for cortisol, it's uh, one infusion. So what about the sequencing and what about the response uh, with bispecific post cortisol failure? So very importantly, we can see that we have a, a complete response rate in 24 to 35% of the patient failing cortisol. So here with odronextamab, the overall response rate post cortisol was 33%, but complete response 27% compared uh, to the best CR rates uh, without cortisol uh, pre administration, previous administration 53%, so slightly lower. But the time to response was similar, and the duration of response for now seems to be similar. With epcoritamab, the complete response rate also seems to be very slightly lower uh, post cortisol, 34%, compared to 42% for patients that did not receive any cells. But again, the duration of response seems to be comparable. And finally, uh, for glofitamab, 42% 42, 42 of the patient post cell responded and 35% of them had a complete response. So this is study extracted, this is a result, sorry, extracted from uh, the clinical trial. And when we look at real life data, uh, uh, these data are represented at ASH these years, uh, and uh, we can see that bispecific might be a, a solution post CAR T cell with an overall response rate of 48% for bispecific and 33% of complete response rate, which is higher as compared to immunochemotherapy, higher as compared to anti PD1, and uh, comparable as compared to polatuzumab. But when we look at the PFS curves, it does not seem to be uh, perfect, yet we can see here with the gray uh, curves uh, with bispecific, but maybe uh, we can have a plateau around 25%. When we look at a uh, late CAR T cell failure, and these are data uh, from the Descartes re registry, well, uh, the six months of PFS with bispecific is 77% as compared to 22% with a chemotherapy. And within uh, this uh, late uh, CAR T cell failure, the complete response rate uh, was uh, around 52%. And we can see here that the median PFS is definitely greater with uh, maybe a plateau, but longer follow-up is definitely uh, warranted. And we have also an increase in the overall survival at six months, 93% with bispecific uh, as compared to 77% uh, with other strategies. So what are the perspectives now with bispecific uh, antibodies? So first, what about the cost stimulation? We saw that with the corti cell, we have the signal one and signal two in the chimeric receptors and the signal three with uh, in vitro cytokine stimulation. So what can we do uh, with a bispecific? So again, in the T cell uh, biology, we have the signal one alone that will induce only tolerance and energy. And when you add the signal two represented here that uh, with 41BP on the T cell and CD28 on the B cell, uh, we have the T cell activation, clonal expansion and effect of functions. So we need this signal two uh, with uh, the bispecific. And a way uh, to provide the signal two would be to add another bispecific linking 41BB and, for example, CD19 on the tumor cell. And this is uh, what is currently uh, ongoing uh, with the in vitro uh, data and uh, phase one trial with a co stimulatory CD1941 BB bispecific added to glofitamine in relapse and refractory non Hodgkin lymphoma. So, this is the step up dosing uh, of the phase one trial. And first, uh, for the phase one, while the safety profile was very comparable to glofitamab single agent with no more CRS or icons. 70% were treated. Most of the treatment-related adverse events was considered as related to glofitamab, and there were no new additive or synergistic safety signals uh, identified in this trial. 
and the the CD1941 uh, BB molecule, sorry, uh, reversed the expansion of the PD1 uh, positive, CD8 positive T effector memory cells in the blood, as you can see here, with a, a striking decrease with a higher dose uh, administration, suggesting that we can have a PK uh, profile uh, corresponding to the mechanism of actions of these molecules. When we look at the response, well, uh, it was uh, a little bit disappointing with uh, the similar complete response and overall response ways as compared to glofitamab single agents, but the dose escalation continues with additive benefits of the combination that are expected at higher dose. So the second signal can also be uh, provided by three specific molecules, as you can see here with the CD2, CD3 and CD19 three specific uh, antibodies. So in vitro, it induced T cell proliferation, cytokine production, and tumor lysis that is greater as compared to the bispecific, and also a more suiting T cell activity and tumor cell canning and proliferation versus the bispecific. So a first in human trial with this molecule, PIT565, is currently uh, ongoing. So other format of tri-specific antibody can enhance the therapeutic uh, efficacy with a co-stimulation. And here we can see the example uh, that will be used in multiple myeloma because the target is CD38. Uh, but here the tri-specific target CD3 and CD28 uh, on uh, the T cell. And we can see here that with this uh, tri-specific, we have a greater T cell activation and greater in vitro efficacy as compared uh, to the bispecific counterpart uh, with a CD38 or CD3 uh, antibody. Finally, a tri-specific antibody can also be used to avoid the immune escape by targeting different targets at CD3 CD19 and CD CD22 presented here uh, in the cartoon, where we have an optimal formation of the immune synapse between the target cell and the T cell. That significantly enhances the tumor efficacy and overcome, can overcome eventually the immune escape compared with the corresponding bispecific antibody alone uh, or in combination. And this uh, comparison was done with a blinatumumab. And in lymphoma, other uh, tri-specific antibody are currently in clinical trial and phase one first in human study with CD3, CD20, and CD79B in relapse and refractory non oncogenic lymphoma currently under investigation. So what uh, combination can we do with bispecific antibody to increase the efficacy? So we saw the signal a combination. And uh, importantly, uh, lenalidomide, that is an immunomodulatory engine that can uh, activate the T cells and the NK cell, could also be used to increase the efficacy of bispecific antibody. And this increase of efficacy can also be uh, obtained with the addition of another anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody, leading also to NK cell activation. Another way to improve and to combine the efficacy will be to add an antibody drug conjugate targeting CD79A as polatizumab vedota. And finally, we will see what are the options with chemotherapy. So first with lenalidomide. Well, the rituximab and lenalidomide combination is, all, is uh, well known with uh, here the data of the World Events trial that show that r square can do as well as air chemotherapy in follicular lymphoma. And we know that lenalidomide can activate the NK cell and the TD8 cell. So that there is definitely a rationale to combine lenalidomide with bispecific. So what about the data uh, here uh, with epcoritamab compared to rituximab and lenalidomide or mosunetizumab combined with lenalidomide? So two phase one, two trial. 66 patients and 29 patients, uh, respectively. The median age was uh, comparable, 65 and 59 for the mosinitizumab lenalidomab trial. Both studies included highly pretreated patients, uh, with maybe a slightly more pretreated patient in the epcoritumab trial, with 47% of the patient that had a primary refractory or PD24 disease, and only 10% in the Mosulen trial. 
The follow-up is extremely short, but we can see that first, the treatment is pretty well uh, tolerated with 43% uh, of TRS, but no grade three or more TRS in both trials. Indeed, we can have, we see neutropenia, but it's not increased as compared to uh, by specific single agent. And there is no more icons as well. When we look at the efficacy, it's pretty impressive with 95% of overall response rates and 80% of complete response in the EPCO R square combination with a two year treatment, and 90% of overall response and 65% of complete response with a modulant combination with 12 cycles. The time to CR is short, and the patient in CR tends to remain in CR. So this, lead, this will lead, sorry, to phase three in relapse and refractory follicular lymphoma that are currently uh, recruiting. So what about EPCO and R-square in first line follicular lymphoma? So 41 patients uh, with a median age of 57 euros, stage three to four in the majority of the cases. The median follow-up again is very short, and again, no more CRS, 51%, no more Neutropenia is also comparable. It's 41 percent and grade three to four in 24 percent of the cases, and rash in 27 percent of the patients. The efficacy in the 29 percent is an uh, CR rate in the majority of them, 86 percent, and overall response rates in 94 percent for this chemo three uh, combination. And we can see here that the majority of the response uh, are at the first uh, response assessment and that they are durable. But of course, this is a very short follow-up and we need a longer follow-up to assess the duration of response. There were two fatal adverse events and two, uh, the, they were uh, both related to COVID-19. So again, a warning with COVID-19 and infections. Five treatment discontinuation, three to, due to AE and two to disease progression. So another combination that we uh, discussed very briefly is polatizumab vedotin that targets CD79A on the tumor cell uh, and that is combined to MMIE or microtubule disruptor. So what about the data on two phase two study with Mosun and polatizumab vedotin or Glofit and polatizumab vedotin? Uh, some uh, so Patient again heavily pretreated, previous line three or two, and half, almost half of them uh, pretreated with corticel in the Mosun uh, polatizumab vedotin uh, trial. The follow up is short, but the rate of CR rate is not uh, greater as compared to single agents, as well the rate of icons is not greater as, comp as compared to single agents. 12% of the patient required to silituzumab with glofitamab and PV combination. And neutropenia were seen in 33 and 50% respectively. Peripheral neuropathy as expected in 42% of the patients with polatizumab bedotin. Few adverse events leading to treatment discontinuation, even though it can be a little bit significant with five in mosinituzumab and eight uh, due to polatizumab in the MOSU-PV trial. What about the response rates? Well, with MOSU PV, uh, we can uh, see that we have uh, a greater response rate in the elderly patient, just as we saw in the single agent uh, data with 72% of overall response and 56 of complete response. And also some response with patient previously treated with CAR T cell, 45% of complete response and 65 of overall response. With glofitamab and polatizumab vedotin, the overall response rate is also very impressive, 80% and half of the patient reach a CR. And again, it's refractory DLBCL. And the majority of CR are ongoing. So definitely this combination is very promising. So what about EPCO and rituximab uh, chemotherapy combination? So EPCO or DHRX or DHSA in patients with relapse and refractory DLBCL eligible for ACT or autologous T cell transplantation. So 27 patients were treated, uh, TFL in 34% of the patient, primary refractory 66% of the patients. So what is interesting here is we can see that the CRS, uh, the CRS rate tend to be lower as compared to epcoritamab single agent, and there are almost no icons. What about the response rate? Well, in the, the, in the total group of 27 patients, 85% were in response, 67 in complete response with the EPCO-RDHX combination. 
16 patients went to transplant and all of them remain in complete response after transplant. 11 patients did not went to transplant and this was due to the physician decisions and this is a little bit the drawback of this abstract and only four of them remain in complete response. So what about the first line? Uh, be specific with ORTROP combination. So we have sweet trial, Mosul ORTROP, Grofit ORTROP, and EPCO ORTROP. And so some data presented at ASH this year or ASCO uh, for Grofit and EPCO ORTROP. So what is interesting is that the CRS uh, is much lower with the Glofit ORTROP as compared to ORTROP, uh, as compared to Glofit alone, sorry. And the overall response rate 86%, share rate 76%, that requires maybe uh, a longer follow up and also uh, to see what is the median PFS, what is the median duration of response, and what if we can improve the sequencing of bispecific and uh, chemotherapy to reach a greater uh, complete response rate. So, what about the, the perspective with different structure and targets? So IgM2323 is a novel bispecific antibody that is based on an engineered pentameric IgM framework. And we can see that with uh, this novel bispecific T cell engaging antibody, we can have a, a more physiologic T cell uh, stimulation and a, a greater engagement of the T cell and cancer cell synapse. So the phase one trial was uh, presented at ASH with safety and efficacy data that you can see here, three months on treatment, discontinuation for progression in the majority of the cases, TRS is pretty low, 25% only, infusion rate to toxicity 30% and neutropenia in only 4%. So there is no tolerability issue, but the response might be a little bit uh, disappointing, as you can see here, uh, with a response uh, only uh, in less than half uh, of the patient with aggressive lymphoma and majority of response in endurance lymphoma. A phase two randomized dose escalation study is ongoing with a pick the winner strategy with two different dosage. Another bispecific that seems to be also uh, very promising, uh, targeting CD19 and CD3. So maybe the data of treatment with this one after CAR system will be uh, more challenging or, or uh, eagerly expected, given that CAR T cell target uh, CD19. So uh, the data in patients with relapse and refractory B cell lymphoma showed that there were no uh, toxicity issue as compared to the other bispecific, and the majority of the patients with follicular lymphoma could reach a complete uh, response. So what about using NK cell instead of T cell? So different target, but on the immune part. And very briefly, I will introduce the AFM13 uh, bispecific antibody that is uh, a chimeric uh, molecules uh, with only a uh, variable fragment and no FC portion that targets CD30 and CD16. Uh, that is a tetravalent innate NK cell engager. And it has very little single agent activity in CHL. And maybe this is because uh, the NK cell in CHL uh, are have a very poor activity. So the solution, sorry, the solution was uh, to use a cold growth derived NK cell to pre-treat them with AFM13 to do kind of a car-like NK cell strategy and then to reinfuse to the patients. So that it will lead to a cytokine induced memory-like NK cell or okay, car-like complex. So you have here the uh, ther theoretical interaction with the NK cell uh, the bispecific that will lead to the tumor cell lysis that express CD30 or CHR or T cell uh, lymphoma. And we can see that the response rate is definitely greater with this uh, strategy with high overall response and CR rates in CHL in green here. But uh, the EFS seems to be pretty short and uh, we definitely need a, maybe a longer follow up. So overall, and this will be uh, my conclusion here, by specific represent uh, an off-the-shelf T-cell redirecting drug for B-cell non hodgkin lymphoma. The toxicity and efficacy profile make them one of the most promising drugs in non hodgkin lymphoma today. The first generation of CD20, CD3 bispecific are in or very close to the clinics. And there is perspective with novel tumor and immune effector cell uh, targets as NK cell. 
There are some remaining questions in the field of bispecific as the tolerance of the products. And we need to define the optimal setting with regards to the administration to minimize the side effects to allow an in or outpatient administration, a subcutaneous administration, see what we can do with the GA101 pretreatment. We need to define the optimal duration of treatment to avoid the T-cell exhaustion. We need to be able to predict the response a profile and to define biomarker of response and of resistance mechanism, of course. We need to see uh, what about uh, we need to see if longer follow-up can secure us on the duration of response that for now remain unsure, and we need to study the retreatment strategies. The sequencing, of course, will be an issue and something to solve in the upcoming years and define the optimal setting with regards to the line of treatment, first line versus relapse and refractory, and define the optimal setting with regards to CAR T cell sequencing for high and low grade non oncogenic lymphoma, where the strategy maybe will be different. And finally, optimal potential combination needs to be also uh, defined and assessed with biological rationale with immediate chemotherapy or antibody drug conjugates. So with that, I will be, I thank you for your attention and, and I will be very happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Sarkozy. Uh, you managed to achieve an incredible tour de force in 66 minutes, walking us through all available research evidence related to bispecific uh, antibody. So uh, actually, I have a very, very long list of questions in front of me, if you allow me. I know we're running a little bit late, but this, is quite, this is quite incredible. Don't worry. I mean, we're really enjoying it. Hundreds of people are connected. This is incredible. So I'll try to structure the questions and I do apologize if we can't take all of them. Can you, first question is about, uh, I'll group the questions for instance about the side effects. Can you comment about the neurotoxicity of these bispecific antibodies and ICANs and whether they are all equal or at this stage we cannot conclude? So they seems to pretty uh, all equal, maybe except with one that seems to present a little bit a greater risk of icons and one uh, icons grade five, but it's it's only an N equal one, and it's always very difficult, as you know, in the phase one trial. Sometimes you have a grade five with neurotoxicity, but is it really an icons? Is it uh, a neurological events that might be of a different origin, it's, it's hard to say. But what we can say is that I think we can be safe with regards to, to the icons. And, and I don't think that there is any fear uh, with this, uh, this kind of adverse event. So let, let, let me take another question about CRS. Uh, uh, should we use any preemptive approach in the management of CRS? or you just wait for the first symptoms and then you can act? Uh, I, I think that the, the recommendation for now are to wait for the first symptom and act. And But we have pretreatment, of course, uh, with dexamethasone and steroids. So yes, there are some, it's not preemptive treatment of the CRS with the C, but there is pretreatment that is pretty important. And also the GA101 or uh, obinutumab pretreatment uh, for glofitamab also reduced the CRS rate. Excellent. Thank you very much. Another important question from Dr. Nikolaeva. Uh, uh, do these bispecific antibodies uh, act on the CNS and cross uh, brain barrier? Well, uh, it's an important question. And uh, actually clinical trial, uh, phase one and phase two clinical trial, we start hopefully very soon uh, with bispecific in this uh, very rare entity that were for now not included in the clinical trial. But I know that some of the trial uh, will be built very soon. And uh, in Curie, where we are very interested in the CNS disease, we will definitely uh, include patient in this kind of trial. Excellent. Thank you very much. One last question about the side effects, and that is, I think, in relation with the issue of T-cell exhaustion, and we have a lot of questions about it, is that can you comment on uh, the incidence and uh, nature of opportunistic infections uh, one would see in general after a certain time uh, with these bispecific antibodies? 
So for the incidents, uh, what, what, what we can say is that uh, the grade five related events were definitively when they occurred related to infections. And they were, they, they tend to be around five to, to, to eight percent, depending on the, on the bispecific and COVID related. So why do they occur? Well, I think that the study uh, are currently ongoing to to understand a little bit more of that. And is it, uh, th but there is definitely something to do because it's also the same for myeloma, where we can see that COVID-19 is an issue and infection is an issue. And we need to, to follow uh, our patient very closely and to provide um, antibiotic prophylaxis and to be very careful on the infectious risk. Excellent. Thank you very much. That's very clear. Uh, and, uh, and this risk of infections is actually true across, you know, the whole landscape of bispecific, irrespective, actually, of the disease. Uh, that brings me to the question. Uh, we have uh, a few questions about uh, uh, the sequence with CAR T cells, because at least immunologically speaking, one would like to do the CAR T cells single shot treatment and maybe use bispecific antibodies later, but probably in the real life, bispecific will be more easily accessible and then people will use CAR T cells after. So what do you think about the sequence? Should we uh, collect lymphocyte before starting uh, bispecific antibodies to avoid you know, uh, getting the uh, exhausted T cells later? Do we have any recommendation guidance or still too so preliminary? preliminary? So recommendation guidance too preliminary, but uh, as you as you mentioned in the in the introduction of the question, in theory yes, in 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 an ideal world, of course yes, it would be fantastic to be able to collect for all the patient uh, the, the the lymphocyte and to do a leukapheresis before any relapse treatment strategy by specific or even any any other one uh, to be able to to bang the cell and to reinfuse and to 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 to, to do the CAR T cell uh, if uh, the progression occurs but in the real life setting we know that it's not so doable. So what about the sequencing? I would say that I don't think that it will be the same for indolent and for aggressive lymphoma. And I think that uh, maybe also the, the nature of the relapse and of the refractoriness of the patient will also lead us to do different sequencing. If the, I mean, the tumor burden with a very high tumor burden, we know that CAR T cells tend to be a little bit less efficient. So maybe uh, doing a uh, a bridging with CAR T uh, with a by specific uh, reg including regimen could be also a, a good strategy. Thank you very much. One question from Dr. Andrew McDonald about whether we can use these by specific antibodies safely and efficiently in those patients with an HIV-related lymphoma. It, it's it's a uh, it's a good question. Uh, so. Efficacy, I don't see why. So, uh, so we, first the data. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, I haven't seen any uh, publication or data in HIV specific cohorts. Uh, then, uh, with regards to the efficacy, I don't see why. Uh, everything depends, of course, of the of the of the T cell that can have the HIV patient. Everything depends on the on the treatment that they will have and where we are with the HIV lymphoma. If it's at of the HIV disease, if it's at diagnosis and and on the, I would say on the on the level of uh, CD4 and CD8 cells. So it, it's hard to answer like that. I think. Okay, one last question about, uh, and I, I'm reading it is that. These bispecific antibodies are so efficient in the relapse refractory setting. So why don't we move them into earlier lines of therapy, even first line therapy? How would you envision the ideal combination first line, for instance? So uh, there are some clinical trials in first line and the, the industry is thinking about clinical trial and combination with chemo uh, in, with R-TROP in the LBCL. So we, we saw the results of the of the phase two. So what we have now is the CR rate, well, 75 or 77%. It's roughly what we get with our drop. So 
but what about if the, the benefit of bispecific was in PFS? So we, we need longer follow-up. And I think we need to work on the, the sequencing uh, of uh, bispecific and chemo. When For now, they, we do uh, bispecific and chemo uh, on the same day in this clinical trial, in cycle two and cycle three, four, and so forth and so on. But maybe the bispecific uh, would be better if done between two cycles. So this needs to be worked on, the, the sequencing with chemo. And then first line and other uh, histology as FL. Again, the strategy is ongoing with a combination with lenalidomide and rituximab or lenalidomide alone with the FCO as square and uh, ozun lenalidomide. And I think this is very, very, very promising. And uh, the relevant trial uh, failed to show the superiority of R square versus R chop. And but uh, maybe EPCO R square will uh, will be able to show the superiority uh, versus R chop, and we will be able to move away from R chop with a follicular lymphoma. And in other indolent histology as well, I, I know uh, the, the bispecific are currently. Uh, We'll go uh, in phase two first line. Well, this has been really fantastic. And definitely we need to invite you again to give us the update of these results when they are released. So okay. thank We'd you very, be very much. Very happy, very happy to do so. Thank you very much, Clementine. Thank you all uh, for being loyal to the ICH uh, uh, webinars. Uh, I do apologize, we didn't take all the questions, but I am sure uh, uh, you can reach out to Dr. Sarkozy of by course. email if needed. And uh, the webinar as usual will be available on demand within the next 24, 48 hours. But for the time being, I'd like to say wherever you are, please stay safe and keep well and see you soon in another ICH activity. Take care.